Hey everybody, Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. Today's video, I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to take a trip back in time to the year 2000. Um, when I originally, when we built this house, this room that I've in, and you've seen in other videos, was built as a home theater. So uh, it has surround speakers in the rear, and then obviously main speakers, and those changed, and a center speaker, which was actually a, a set of Kef bookshelf speakers wired in series uh, with the tweeters facing on the outer edge, laid on their sides. Um, so anyway, but it was all powered by a real monster receiver in its day. It's the Harman Kardon AVR 7000. And it was such a significant piece in the Harman Kardon lineup that it actually made it, or made mention, they made mention of it on the Harman Kardon Wikipedia page. Now the story behind the AVR 7000, and I'll show you this in, in, I'll show you the unit in just a second, was this was Harman's attempt to outdo everybody else in the home theater world. Now it was an $1,800 unit in 2000, which equates to about $4,300 in today's dollars. So it was very top of the line, competing against Denim or Ants, everybody else, but doing it in Harman Kardon's normal way, which was not the way everybody else did stuff. So the unit itself is a monster, and I'm gonna to have to read the specs because I didn't measure it. It is 17 inches wide, seven and a half inches, excuse me, 7.6 inches high, 20 inches deep, it's a beast, and it weighs 50 pounds. Now it's rated at 110 watts by five, all five channels driven, and that's the remarkable thing. And a frequency response rating is 10 hertz to 100,000. Now, several magazines in the day tested it, and one of them I wanna to read, to, read to you from was uh, Home Theater Magazine, and they tested the amplifier um, into eight ohm load, and it started clipping at 131 watts, and that was a 0.008%. Uh, and it reached at 0.1%, it was 151 watts, and at 1% distortion, it was 169 into eight ohms. Into four ohms at 0.008, it was 161.3 watts. At 0.01, it was 236 watts, and at 1% distortion, 283 watts. Um, Stereo Review reviewed the magazine, and with, and they made mention of it, with a notably sagging AC line, they were able to get uh, 100, they were able to get 125 watts, all five channels driven before, before it reached 0.1% uh, clipping. And then uh, they were able to get 168 by five, all channels driven uh, at 0.1% THD. So this thing is an absolute beast. And when we go inside of it, you'll see that. Now, the story behind this unit is when it came out, there was, and I, I, most of you know, I have a very long relationship with Armin Carden, having worked with him for him, everything else. So at the time when this receiver was coming out, uh, they wanted to call it a citation unit because citation always was Harman Kardon's premium product. And so they wanted to call it a citation because it was such a massive move forward in home theater product. Um, and it's just a 5.1, uh, unit. It's, you know, uh, just a standard Dolby Digital from 2000 and DTS. Um, but because of all of the work that went into it and the design, and you'll see this thing is really remarkably well built. Um, they wanted to call it a citation unit. And um, because again, it, citation always was Harman's best product. Well, Dr. Harman nixed the idea. He didn't want a receiver to be called citation because in his mind and in the past, citation always referred to Harman Kardon's very best components, amplifiers, preamplifiers, uh, and that. So it what was not able to be called a citation unit. It is the Harman Kardon AVR 7000. Um, they are very rare on the used market. Um, it is a flag in the sand at this point in time. Units that came out after it that looked similar to it weren't constructed quite, quite the same because Dr. Harmon had retired from the company and became chairman emeritus and then new management took over and Dr. Harmon went off and I'm gonna do a history on Harmon Carden. He went off and bought Newsweek magazine for a dollar and of course he was very politically active. Um, so things got a little bit different and then ultimately the Harmon Carden brand as we know today is just nothing but a bunch of Bluetooth speakers which is absolutely breaks my heart. But anyway, we're gonna get into this Harmon Carden AVR 7000 and I'll show you how it works. So this is the front of the unit. As you can see, it's a monster. That's the size of my hand and it's incredibly deep. Um, wonderful industrial design. Harman Kardon always won awards for their industrial design. And I think at the Consumer Electronics Show, the, the year they introduced this, it won an Innoventions Award uh, from uh, the folks at the CES organization. 
Um, very logically laid out, we have our surround sound modes, we have our input modes, we have additional inputs over here, because there's a ton on the back. And obviously there are a variety of different surround sounds, matrix surround sounds, derived surround sounds that you won't see there. But um, you'll just see your, your Dolby Digital, DTS, Dolby Digital, ProLogic, Dolby 3 channel stereo or surround off. And then Hall 1, Hall 2 theater, VMAX, which is interesting in that it is almost like wearing a pair of headphones. It puts everything in the center of the, uh, of the uh, soundstage. It's really interesting. And I'll, I'll read a little bit about it from one of the reviews in a moment. I never really used it very much. And then Logic 7, which is from uh, Lexicon, which is a Harman company, it is a derived surround sound that gives you all five channels plus a mono uh, uh, set, you know, they say Logic 7, five channels, five speakers, one subwoofer, that's six speakers. And then by using the rear surround speakers, they can derive a mono rear speaker to help locate certain sounds and steer it. So it's less diffuse and kind of more pinpoint as things move forward, left and right behind you and things like that. So it was it's really cool and got a lot of praise for that. So the unit is pretty straightforward. We've got our tone mode. We can go tone direct. We can have the tone out. We have bass and treble controls and a balance control, so we can have that off. We can choose our surround sound mode. It has an FM AM tuner in it, so we can pick the tuning and we can pick the uh, band AM or FM. We can do our presets. We can choose our source and an FM mode if we want to do mono. And then up here is the set and that's manual tuning. And then, uh, or I'm sorry, scroll through the presets. Then there's a test tone. So when we're setting up the system, we can put a one kilohertz test tone through and then adjust the levels of each of the speakers. And, and I'll show you that on screen in a minute. You can choose uh, the speaker on or front speaker, and then I can choose rear speakers. I'm not in, I don't have any rear speakers hooked up, so it doesn't show it. Uh, channel, uh, what, you know, front left, center, front right, rear left, rear right. Uh, digital select, what input you want to use, because it does have digital inputs on coax and optical, as you'll see in the back. And then delay time for your surround sound modes. Now, you can also do all of those things through the on-screen display, which we'll get to in just a second. And also on the front we have, and this is before the days of HDMI. So we have a, a, a S video input. Uh, we have a composite video and composite aut or regular standard analog audio input. So in those days, if you had your camcorder, you could plug it in, run it through this. And then if you had your VCR connected, you can use this as the switching uh, unit to get to all of your different sources and things like that. So that's the front panel. It gives you a display over here. It shows you what speakers are active. And obviously I have no speakers connected to it right now because we're just doing the video. But it'll show you left, right, center, uh, left rear, right rear, and then the derived center if we're doing Logic 7 mode. It's really cool. So we're gonna go ahead and switch around to the back of the unit so you guys can see that. And then we'll go inside and then we'll talk about some other stuff. Actually, what I'm gonna do first is let's go ahead and look at the menuing system. It's pretty cool and it, it's a bit old fashioned, but you'll see it. All right, so this is what you see. It's just a standard blue screen, but if we turn on the on-screen display, okay, you can see there we have input set up, which you know, takes us through our various inputs. You know, DVD, is it a digital in or is it an analog in? So if we wanted to do CD and we wanted to use the inboard D to A, we could do one of four digital inputs. So analog standard RCA, optical one, optical two, coax one, coax two. Um, and it has quite a good DA and we'll talk about it when we get into it. So then we can return to the menu, surround setup, you know, surround off, center delay, surround crossover frequency for subwoofers, night mode, which means that the vol it kind of compresses or levels volume. So it's uh, not quite so peaky or dynamic. So that was kind of an interesting mode. And of course the Logic 7 Music, Logic 7 Cinema, VMAX, which is, I'll have to read about that one, read you about that one, because it's really interesting and it's very hard for me to describe it. And then of course you've got all your standard theater, Hall 1, Hall 2, Dolby 3, Dolby Pro Logic, Dolby Digital and DTS. Um, and then returning back to the menu, speaker setup, you know, what are your speaker size? Your left and right are large, your center is small, your surrounds are small, you got a subwoofer, yes, whatever, and you can change that if you want, none or large, whatever you need. Um, again, not very fancy, but very functional. Output adjust, this is to adjust the level of all of your uh, speakers. And right now, what you can't hear, and you'll see it switching through the different speakers, is it's, adjust, it's putting out a test tone so that you can adjust your speakers so that all of them are in balance, you know, rears 
and, and fronts and center and everything so that you get the best possible effect. Um, so it does do that automatically, which is kind of interesting. And then channel adjust, this is if you manually want to channel, uh, adjust things. So this actually came in really handy if you wanted to adjust your subwoofer. And you could go plus or minus 10 dB on that adjustment. And then, of course, multi-room. This does have the ability to do a multi-room. Um, and by the way, just so you guys know, that's what the remote control looks like, the standard remote control. And then there is a multi-room remote control, which looks much smaller. And to do multi-room, you needed a unit called the HE100, which was an infrared uh, remote sensor that could plug into the back of the unit. And you could use it that way. Let me put that back on. Sorry about that. And so you could do multi-room if you wanted to. And then the advanced mode takes you into how you want to set up the, the, the front panel display, the default volume. You can have it so when you turn it on that the default volume is quiet. You know, do you want the semi OSD? That's the display on the screen at the bottom of the screen that would show you the speaker you're looking at or whatever. And then that timeout and then the full OSD timeout and that, and then you would exit out of there. So pretty comprehensive um, set of uh, adjustments given its time, you know, again, 2000. So not super fancy, but super functional and really, really easy to set up. Uh, that was one of the nice things about it. So now we're gonna move around to the back of the unit and I'm gonna apologize for hand holding, uh, but we'll go there now. Here, hopefully you guys can see the back of the unit okay. I've got a composite video plugged in so I could do the on-screen display. I'm gonna pull that out. Um, one of the things you'll notice, obviously, we're gonna go from left to right. So we've got our antenna inputs, coax or standard uh, 300 ohm wire antenna. And then on the input side, we've got DVD, video one in and out, video two out, video three out, monitor out, multi-room out. Below that is CD, and that's the audio for multi-room out. We have a tape loop, and then down below, we have what's called six-channel direct, which allowed us to uh, go uh, out from this to another amplifier if we wanted to and send the Dolby signals out. And then for, in these days, high def, all we had was component video, PRPBY, you know, red, green, blue. So you had connections there for that. And then in, on the digital input, we have optical one, optical two, coaxial one and two, and then we have actual digital outputs. So we've got a coax output or an optical output and a coax output. We've got a line level out for the subwoofer. We've got center channel out, surround channels out, and you'll notice it's a pre-out main in for surrounds and a pre-out main in for main channel. So really, really remarkable. Nice binding posts, you know, for banana plugs, for front, uh, front right, front left, right rear, left rear, center. And then of course, we don't see these anymore, AC outlets on the back. Now you can see this unit was built in December of 2000. Um, I got it then. Um, I was working with uh, Harman at the time, so um, I got a very good deal on it. Um, but anyway, so that's the back channel, or the back panel of the Harman AVR 7000. And we're going to go around to the uh, top of the unit. I'm going to take the top off and we're going to take a look inside. I think you'll be impressed. Okay, I apologize again for the hand holding, but we're inside the AVR 7000 and you can see it's got a massive toroidal transformer. You'll also notice, and it's a bit hard to see as we go up against the heat sink, there are multiple output devices for each channel. All five channels are done push-pull. Uh, with multiple output devices. So that makes it really remarkable. What You can't see all of them down there, but you'll notice there's two output devices, two output devices. That's just the front channel on this side. And same on the other, and then down below on the heat sink are the output tran transistors, excuse me, for the uh, rear channels and surround. You can see the layout, it's quite large. These are each 22,000 microfarad capacitors, so high current capability. As a matter of fact, Harman rated this at 70 amps of high instantaneous current capability, uh, which was always a big deal for Harman Kardon current capability because speakers run on current, not watts. So having high current output was really, really important. And all five channels have that same high current output. And that 70 amps of high current output is obviously summed uh, for just the two channels, two main channels. Um, the unit itself has a Burr Brown uh, ladder DAC, or, or excuse me, Burr Brown R to R DAC chips, and then uses a Pacific Microsonics chip to do HDCD decoding, and then a separate Pacific Microsonics chip for all the surround decoding, um, including uh, the Dolby Digital DTS. 
um, and any of the hall surrounds or matrix surrounds. Logic 7 is on its own chip. Logic 7 Cinema and Music is on its own chip. Um, and then in addition to that, they have a, a, the mode called VMAX, and I'll explain that now. VMAX was, if you only had two speakers, it would give you a phantom surround system. And it worked okay. Um, maybe I had it, didn't have it set up correct, but a number of the reviewers, magazine reviewers at the time commented that VMAX actually fooled them into thinking that the rear speakers were on and they went back to check them uh, and they weren't. So VMAX was interesting. A number of other companies have tried to do stuff like that. Bose has tried to do it with two speakers with a phantom surround. Obviously some sound bars have tried to do that, but this was doing it back in 2000. So way ahead of its time. So the AVR 7000 was an absolute beast, sounded amazing. Um, they're really interesting, very cool piece. Um, I have, I've had it for many, many years. I swapped it out for a two channel Cambridge unit, primarily because I was more after a pure warmer sound. The Harman is really muscular. It is a bit of a V curve, uh, slightly pulled back in the mid range, very much, very excellent bass because it just had the ability to control any woofer you wanted. And then on the top end, a little bit, a little bit sizzly for my taste, but really, I mean, overall an excellent sounding system. And honestly, I listened to this thing for, from 2000, uh, when I got it in 2000 through to probably 2020 when I finally upgraded to my Cambridge and started reconfiguring my system more for two channel than, than multi-channel. So anyway, and also too, this thing's gotta go in for service. One of the channels is out on the left side, it's not working. And I don't know if it's just a fuse or whatever, I've gotta dig into it, but I just haven't had time. So anyway, that's a look at the AVR 7000 and I'll be right back with you. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that. It was an interesting look at an old piece. Um, the reason I wanted to do it is the AVR 7000 was a real, kind of move forward in um, the home theater uh, marketplace. Prior to that, you had a lot of Pioneer, Kenwood, Sony, kind of surround sound was kind of treated as something that, you know, we have to do because the market wants it, but no one bothered to put the time, effort and energy up until this point to really, de you know, design a piece that could handle any load, uh, handle any, virtually any input that, of course, pre HDMI. And this did do HD through the component inputs, but also something that sounded remarkable. So prior to this, everybody was doing a lot of, you know, the, the, the chip amps, Pioneer used those chips. They're discrete, like the TI chips used in some of the entry level Cambridge pieces, but a, a chip amp can do fine for low Watts. It can't do fine for high Watts. So that's why you have all the discrete stage here with, you've got you know, four uh, output devices on the front two channels, you know, push pull four output devices, each channel. And then of course you go into a push pull for all the surround channels. Uh, so tremendously powerful. So after this unit came out in 2000 and it, it got a lot of accolades, um, a lot of the other manufacturers started to up their game to put in uh, more discrete components, more output transistors rather than chip output devices, um, and to make them a little bit more powerful and a little bit more performance. Still, most of those manufacturers went for features, lots of glitz and glamour, fancy interfaces, all kinds of other stuff, fancy displays. Harman put their money in sound quality, and I'm actually gonna do a history of the company. Um, as I said, this piece was originally, they wanted to call it a citation unit, and Dr. Harman nixed the idea. Um, and I don't, you know, I understand why he did that, but unfortunately he, you know, kind of retired from the company shortly thereafter, uh, and things started to change and Harman Kardon started to, in my estimation, go downhill. They made some good products through the mid to mid nineties, maybe just a little bit into the late nineties, but nothing as beefy and as bulky and as monstrous as this thing, uh, that all changed because again, you know, Harman's largest retailer in the United States in going into the 90s was Circuit City. And you can't trust the Circuit City salesman. And I'm sure there's some really nice folks that worked at Circuit City. I don't want to offend anybody, but they didn't have the depth of knowledge that, um, you know, an independent hi-fi, uh, you know, reseller would have. When I was in retail, we were the, one of the largest Harman Kardon dealers in the country. We had five stores and we were up there close to what Circuit City was doing national. Well, they had 35 stores in and around the Atlanta area and so forth. But 
we dug deep into it and got to know these products really well and understood the design philosophy. And again, I'll get into that when I get into the, do the history of Harman Kardon. But anyway, so the AVR 7000, neat piece, cool. Um, you know, if you can find one used, I don't know. You could buy it if you want to. I'm not sure. There's a lot of good stuff today. Um, things have moved on. There's no HDMI on this. So it becomes a bit of a challenge to try to use it currently. But from a sound standpoint, in this series in from 19 or from 2000, there were some stereo integrated amplifiers and stereo receivers that had the same design and build quality and, and focus on sound quality that this Harman has. So there were some amazing integrated amps that had big power supplies, lots of power, could drive any load, had great inputs and outputs on them and things like that. So if you're thinking about getting something vintage, maybe look at those. I mean, vintage Harman stuff is amazing. Uh, I'm not going to dig into it now. I'll save that for a later video. Anyway, thank you guys so very much for walking, watching. Remember in my description, there are uh, playlists that I have on title that you're welcome to look at. Um, you know, my uh, jazz for rock fans, my classical for rock fans, my horrible music for <laughs> the hearing impaired. Nobody watched that video, but it was fun to make. Um, and then some other playlists. Uh, I listen to a lot of electronic music and I have a playlist out on title called Electronica for Audiophiles give it a listen. It's pretty cool stuff. And the nice thing about some of the electronic music is, remember, all, all soundstage that you hear in any recording other than some really good classical recordings is manufactured in the studio by the engineer. It's not, doesn't exist in real life. Um, you know, remember Kind of Blue was recorded in mono and they made a stereo recording out of it. So electronica stuff has lots of panned sounds going around and I could, I can go way out uh, either side of the speakers with that kind of stuff. So give that playlist a try. Let me know what you think. I do appreciate your comments. I really do appreciate it if you give me a like, and I would very much appreciate it if you gave me or gave me your subscription. That would be wonderful. And if anyone is interested, I will be at Exponus Friday and Saturday next week. Um, look for me. I'll have a t-shirt on that says old guy hi-fi on the back. Um, and stop by, say hello. Um, I'd love to talk to you. I love your comments, and I really appreciate the time that you give me. So thank you so much. And signing off from the old guy hi-fi channel. Everybody have a great day.